right, good morning. Good to see you here this morning. We started a series a couple weeks ago on the book of Revelation, themes of Revelation. We're only doing six sermons, so we're not diving into everything, but I'd be happy and love to talk this stuff on the side with you if you, uh, if you so choose. The Greek word apocalypsis is where we get the word for revelation. It means to uncover or to reveal. And so what's happening here is God is revealing, Jesus is revealing things that are going to happen at the end of time, things that are happening now, first century, 21st century. And one of the things that's being revealed to us, I think one of the blessings, is that we're going to see Jesus more clearly. We get a, if we get a gospel, only a gospel view of Jesus, we see a, an incredible view of Jesus, meek and mild and loving, and also uh, moments of, uh, you know, where he showed his power, the Mount of Transfiguration, turning the tables over. But the fuller picture of Jesus we get from the book of Revelation, and we, we see him in all his glory. I think that is a blessing when you understand who Jesus is. And uh, it's a book of encouragement because we get to see who he is. It encourages us. It encouraged believers in the first century who were suffering under intense persecution. John wrote this somewhere in about 90 or so, A.D. 90. That's 60 years of persecution, first from the Jews, then from the Romans. And they had another 200 years of persecution to go. So John was writing this to tell them, stay faithful, hang in there. Don't throw in the towel, and to help you, I want to show you who Jesus really is. I believe people were able to keep the faith and even go to their death. That's what we call martyrs, martyrdom, as a witness for Christ because they understood exactly what John was writing about here. They understood who Jesus was. One of the great stories of Christian courage during this whole uh, early time frame is the story of the life and death of a second century, really first century to second century, his life span from A.D. 69 to about 155, 56. His name is Polycarp. If you were around a few years ago, we did a series where we talked about some of these early leaders, and he was one that we highlighted. Polycarp was a student of the old apostle John. He was one of his students. He was mentored by him. John, in fact, may have been thinking of Polycarp when he wrote in his third letter, a little third letter near the end of the book, when John wrote, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, that gives me joy as a Christian father, and I hope it does you too as a Christian parent, but John was talking really more in a spiritual sense here. I have no greater joy than to know that those that I've touched, those lives that I've touched, those marriages that I've performed, the, the, the people that I've taught, the ones like Polycarp that I've mentored are holding and walking in the truth. And walking in the truth was going to cost them something. If you remember, Polycarp was from Smyrna. If you remember the words in the letter to Smyrna, Jesus told them, they said, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Some of you will be in prison and some of you will be put to death. But he said, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. And maybe that's what Polycarp carried with him. Like his mentor, Polycarp was an old man when the Romans finally decided they'd had enough of his influence. Now, Polycarp, I have to believe, and history tells us, was a peaceful man. He was a good citizen. Uh, there was only one thing he wouldn't do, and that is worship the emperor. He wouldn't worship the emperor. So finally the time came at about 155, A.D. 155, where they sent the, uh, the Roman proconsul, the local uh, sheriff, if you will, to go get him and force him to bow the knee to Caesar. Of course, uh, Polycarp wasn't going to do that. The Roman proconsul was a little bit sympathetic toward him because they knew each other, and he said, just curse Christ publicly. You know, do it here, and you can repent later. Just curse Christ publicly, and I'll release you. Polycarp said, 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? So the sheriff 
I'll call him the sheriff, okay? The sheriff said, then just throw incense on the altar of Caesar. You know, that's one thing every year, every Roman citizen was required to go to the, uh, you know, to the, their local bust of Caesar, their local little statue of Caesar, because Caesar was worshipped as a god, not just the emperor, but as a god emperor, and just throw a little incense. Every Roman citizen was required to do that. So he said, just throw a little incense on the altar. Polycarp said, if you imagine for a moment that I would do that, then I think you pretend that you don't know who I am. Hear it plainly. I am a Christian. The proconsul threatened to release the wild beast on him, to put him into the arena where they got their sport. Polycarp said, bring them on. I love that, don't you? Bring them on. I would change my mind if it meant going from the worst to the better, but not to change from the right to the wrong. Finally, the sheriff's patience was gone, and he said, then I'm going to burn you alive. And Polycarp said, you threaten fire that burns for an hour and is gone, but the eternal fire of judgment on the wicked is forever. Some say that when they began the fire against Polycarp, that for a while he was miraculously protected. Eventually it consumed him and burned him alive. But they heard him say, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour so that in the company of the martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. And so he died for his faith. And, I, and again, I think the, the reason that many Names that we won't even know on this side of eternity who went to their death, who died for the faith, did that because they had a clear picture of who Jesus is and his power and his authority and his majesty and his glory and how he was truly, as a song we sang, Lord over all. I want you to see the big picture here. This letter, I want you to see it in the big picture, was written to encourage the believers of that time. All right? And so it's very strategically written, and you'll kind of see that as we go. But what we have here in chapter 1 is that who's writing this, who's, who's hearing, and, uh, and, and who's, who's writing it, and it's Jesus, and there are, there's title after title after title of him that really just paint the picture of all that he is. Chapters 2 and 3, he's talking to the churches. In other words, he's saying, look, you, you churches, you Christians, right now, the first century Christians... I, I, I want to talk to you because times are about to get hard. And some of you need to straighten up. Some of you need to repent. Some of you need to get back to your first love. Some of you need to throw sexual immorality and all the corruption of the world. And you need to come back to me. So if chapters 2 and 3 include scathing condemnation of a first century Christian, and because it's the Bible, it also applies to us, Condemnation of a lukewarm faith, of a love of convenience and comfort over commitment to Christ. Condemnation for compromise with the culture. If that's what chapters 2 and 3 were doing, which they were, then chapters 4 and 5 give us the solution to a lukewarm faith, to a compromise with the culture, to a, a commitment to, uh, to comfort over sacrifice or commitment. And the, it's the same solution as today if you're compromising with the culture, if you have a lukewarm faith. Chapters 4 and 5 are really about biblical worship. It's about biblical worship. I'm not talking about gathering in church for an hour on Sunday and checking the box saying I did my worship time for the week. I'm talking about a life-encompassing Life of worship, biblical worship. What is it? Tim Keller, a preacher in New York City, defines it this way, and I like this definition. It is seeing what God is worth and giving him what he's worth. That's what biblical worship is. The songs we sing, the lessons we teach, whether here or over in the children's space or upstairs in the student space, everything should remind us of the value of Jesus in our lives. It, it, it should remind us of who God is, who Jesus is, and all that he controls, and which is all. I don't believe we can 
recapture that view of him and keep a lukewarm faith. I don't, I don't think we can give him all that he's worth and compromise with the culture. I mean, it's just not going to happen. The two aren't going to happen. If you see God for all that he is, if you recognize Jesus for all that he is, there's no way you're going to compromise with culture. Your life is going to change. What we have here, unfortunately, in our world today, in 21st century America, and maybe 21st century Earth, is a, is a, a Christian view and life for so many who undervalue what God is worth. They undervalue the worth of Jesus. And so we walk around with this fear and anxiety, and we don't really try anything too risky because, you know, we don't want to upset people. We don't want to ups rock the boat. We don't want to get into trouble because we've lost how precious and how valuable Jesus really is. News story several years ago told the story of a young man named Dakota Guerin. He was charged with stealing a rare coin collection from this older lady in Portland, Oregon. And not long after, uh, uh, you know, he, he had been coming in for, to do some work for her. And not long after he had finished and was gone, she noticed the collection was gone. But she didn't realize it was him because a lot of people had been in and out of her house. And uh, they were rare and valuable coins. But uh, this guy didn't realize what he had, and the way they caught him was that uh, he took his girlfriend out for a date one weekend, and one, some of the cash he used to pay for the ticket was uh, one of the quarters that he had stolen from her, and this quarter was worth a 100 bucks. So it was recognized. And then later he he used another quarter, which was worth $18,000. Wouldn't you love to run across one of those quarters to pay for pizza? So they eventually caught him. They eventually caught him. And the news article reported it this way. It said, Garen has been charged with first-degree theft and is being held in jail on a $40,000 bond or about 75 cents, depending on how you look at it. And you know, that's what we end up doing, though, isn't it? We, we have this undervalued worth of God, and it impacts so much of who we are and what we do. And when we undervalue God and Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, when we undervalue God, it impacts our life. We, we have more stress. We... We worry about more things. We somehow think he's not able to take care of us or the problems we have. We live with anxiety, and we kind of stay in our little bubble of comfort. That's what we, we do. And we kind of treat prayer like it's doing him a favor. I love A.W. Tozer's quote where he says, A low view of God is the cause of a hundred lesser evils a high view of god is a solution to ten thousand problems it's biblical worship biblical worship is the solution to ten thousand problems biblical worship is when you recognize how much god is worth his value is full value and you give that to him you give him what he is worth some of you experience experience this you've experienced both sides of this some of you are worried and anxious about things in your life now it's human nature to have anxiety and have worry you know it's a capability that god made us with but it's what you do with that that matters if you live with that day in and day out and you never take that to god and just lay it at his feet then evidently you don't think he's big enough to deal with it it's a rare person these days who has all these problems, but they're not worried one bit. They're not losing sleep because they put it at the feet of Jesus and they're not taking it back. And some of you have experienced that where you have put it there and you're okay. You're okay. Maybe your problems aren't going to work out the way you'd like for them to, but they're going to work out when God is in charge. So let's look at chapter 4 of Revelation, <clears throat> all right? We've got this 
big view of Jesus. He's condemned the church for different things. He's commended them for certain things. And now he's, uh, we're looking at chapter 4. And he's going to show them <clears throat> what biblical worship looks like. We're going to see this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, I'm going to pause right here and explain a little bit of my end-time theology. And the reason I'm doing this is because I think they're, they're the one major view of a lot of people in Christianity is the view I want to I want to talk about, but I want to tell you I'm not of that view. And it's called, um, uh, you know, this eschatology is the word. Eschaton means the end time. And there's this view of a silent or a secret rapture. It's the Left Behind series. Anybody remember that series that came out many, many years ago? Left Behind, you know, there were people, uh, they were flying in an airplane, and all of a sudden nothing was left but their clothes and their folded glasses and, uh, you know, maybe a book or something. And uh, everywhere uh, in the series, everywhere on this one particular day, you, all you'd see is people's clothes, I guess, were going up naked. I don't know. That's not a good image for us. But, um, but that was the Left Behind series, you know. And people were gone, and there was great chaos and disturbance. Pilots were missing and drivers of vehicles, and it was just like, wow, what happened to these people? And then finally somebody realized, oh, the rapture happened. Well, the rapture happened. But will there really be a silent or secret rapture? Now, the reason I bring this up is because in the book of Revelation, this is where it happens, if you believe that. This is where it happens because he says, I look, behold, a door standing up in heaven, and he said, come up there. So John, in this sense, would represent the church, and they would be gone to heaven. Now, this, uh, the rapture idea really comes from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, where the apostle Paul is writing, and he says, you know, this the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, a, a command, a great command and a cry, and uh, 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 we who are left and remain will be caught up with him in the air. And that word caught up in English comes from uh, the Latin word rapturas, which comes from a Greek word, harpazo. And so it comes over to us from the Latin Vulgate as rapture. And also 1 Corinthians 15, 51, where the apostle Paul again writes about stuff happening in the twinkling, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And he talks about the trumpet call of God and, and, uh, uh, and all this. And so this, this, uh, this is called premillennial dispensationalism. It's premillennial. The millennial refers to a thousand-year reign. Pre, of course, means before that, that the rapture happens before that. And so the timeline of a premillennial dispensationalist looks like this. The next thing to happen is the rapture, but it's a secret rapture. The only people going to know about it when it happens are Christians because they're going to disappear and then the other people are going to realize all the Christians have disappeared. And then there's going to be seven years. This is according to this view. I don't subscribe to this view, okay? If you want to, you can. It's not, to me, a big deal. Uh, because in the end, we, we're both going to be fine. But then there's seven years of tribulation. The last three and a half years gets really bad. And then the second coming, what I call the second second coming, so he comes the second time, the first time, the first time, the second time, and doesn't put his feet on the ground. He just calls people up. But this is the second second coming where he comes and all the way down, he puts his feet on the ground. I don't know what you call the first second coming, but that, that's the first one. This is the second one. And then uh, for a thousand years, he will reign on the earth. So after 1,007 years, the devil will be loosed. The battle of Armageddon happens. It's not much of a battle. It's boom, taken care of. The final judgment and the lake of fire are heaven. So this is the timeline, as I understand it, from a premillennial dispensational 
Dispensation means that there are different time periods. I want to propose to you a different view, I think a more biblical view, which is um, no silent rapture. There's nothing silent about this rapture. Here in Revelation 4 and in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in 1 Corinthians 15, there's nothing silent. There's trumpets, there's archangels, there's the loud shouts. There will be nothing silent about this rapture. And this is, by the way, the only place, the only three places that I know of where the rapture, silent secret rapture, is mentioned. So there's nothing silent about this. It will not be a quiet thing. Trust me when I tell you, when the, I believe in the rapture. Don't get me wrong. I just believe when the rapture happens, when the rapture happens, it's over. It's over. Secondly, I don't believe in the silent rapture premillennial theology with the seven years of tribulation and a thousand-year reign because since when would God take the church out of the world in its darkest hour. In John 16, 33, Jesus told his disciples, he says, in this world, you will have tribulation or trouble. And then he said, did he say this? Did he say, but don't worry about it. You're not even going to be here to experience it. Did he say that? No. He said, take heart. I have overcome the world. That's John 16, 33. Jesus never said you're not going to experience any trouble. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, John said, Revelation 1, 9, which is supposedly before the rapture, John said, we're in the tribulation. We're partners in the tribulation. Revelation 1, 9. It doesn't seem right from God's perspective and his purpose and mission of the church that when the church is, when the, when the world, when the earth is suffering the most, that God would exempt the church, that he would take us out of it. You know what the church is? The church is the suppressor of evil. The church is the, is the salt of the earth. We're in the world to hold back evil. I mean, this country was founded on Christian principles, and, and I want you to know that the church... America has been the most beneficent and um, uh, giving organi or country because the, of the presence of the church. And it comes from who we are deep down that we want to help people. We want to give to other countries. Now, you know, it's a little overboard now, but that's kind of where it comes from. And it, the problem now is we're giving what we don't have, right? Giving money we don't have. I don't think God would take the church out of the world in the darkest hour. Thirdly, this view provides for people to have a second chance after the first, second coming of Christ. You know, once people look around and notice all the Christians are gone, and it's either going to make them very happy or very sad. And if, if, if they have squandered their life, what do you think you're going to do during that seven-year tribulation? They're going to get right. I think it's a, dangerous, it's a dangerous theology that tells people you don't have to be ready when the rapture happens. You'll have time after the rapture to come to Christ. Don't you think that's a dangerous theology? It sure is. And finally, according to Jesus, tribulation has already started. I mentioned John 16, 33. I mentioned Revelation 1, 9. I talked about Polycarp. Indeed, great tribulation has been happening since day one. You might say, no, 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 it's going to get bad. It's going to get a lot worse. Tell that to Polycarp when you see him. Tell that to the people who are having their heads cut off today in Muslim-controlled countries. Tell that to entire Christian villages that have been exterminated by haters of Jesus. You might say, no, that seems bad. You lost your family and you're losing your life, but it's going to get worse. I mean, you know the difference between major surgery and minor surgery, don't you? Minor surgery is when it's on you. Major surgery is when it's on me. No, tribulation has already started. It's already started. 
we have to be careful not to look at this from our American perspective. I mean, we, we, have, we have a view of tribulation that is the rest of the world would laugh at. Our friends in Haiti, when they hear about a friend I have that got upset because the waitresses at Bob Evans wouldn't cut the, um, the cantaloupe, the rind off of the cantaloupe, he was upset. I mean, they, they don't do that at Bob Evans anymore unless you have a waitress that'll do it for you. I mean, that's tribulation, huh? I mean, it, it, he was upset enough to leave the restaurant. We have to be careful not to think of tribulation from our American perspective because we, we don't really even know what tribulation is. The world is suffering even now. The voice of the martyrs is crying out. So, again, we don't have to agree about this. You can believe in the premillennial dispensationalism. I'll believe in the amillennial, which is, I believe, the thousand years are going on right now. I think Jesus is reigning. Is there anybody in here who would say Jesus is not in charge right now? He's reigning. Thousand years is a figurative term for a complete set of time. Tribulation is seven years. Seven is the, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a perfect, if you will. It's full. It's, it's complete time that we're going to suffer. And I think it started when Jesus left the earth and it's going on now and it will continue until he returns. But let me just tell you, when the rapture happens, you need to be ready. You won't have time to get a picture of it on your phone and send it to your mother. You won't ha have time to post it on your Instagram page and say, oh, look what I saw in the sky. It will be no time. You might be in mid chew of a piece of cantaloupe from Bob Evans. You, you might be in the shower. You might be sitting here in church. You might be driving down the road. But when it happens, it's going to be fast in the twinkling of an eye. And there's going to be no time left to prepare. And it'll be the last time you ever had to hear the gospel. That's my opinion. Be ready. I don't want to tell you that you've got time after that to be ready. Because if you have time after that to be ready, then what's the, what's the hurry? Just wait until all the Christians are gone, and then you can accept Christ the next day before it gets really, really too bad. So I want you to notice as we look through the rest of this chapter the, what John is trying to say here about the throne. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne, 14 times in this chapter alone, stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. I think what John is seeing there, Jesus is showing, is that it's all calm. It's a sea of glass. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now, before I finish this chapter, I want to answer some questions from this chapter. First of all, who was on the throne? I don't think there's any doubt this is God the Father. The sights, the sounds, the colors, everything that John is experiencing here is just overwhelming to his first century language. I mean, he's like, I don't even know how to describe this he uses the word like it was like this and it was like that and it was like this and so this is God the father and I want to tell you this is the bedrock of Christian theology that there is a throne in heaven and God is sitting on it amen that's the bedrock of what we believe that there's a God in heaven and God the father is sitting on it who are the 24 elders 
most likely, as I said earlier a couple sermons ago, talking about the numbers, this is the complete church of God. Old Testament, New Testament, 12 uh, tribes, 12 uh, disciples, 12 apostles, rather. Uh, this is the complete redeemed God, uh, people of God. And I want you to notice they're wearing crowns too, but their crowns, the Greek word here is Stephanos. It's not diadem. Stephanos was a, a crown made of laurel wreaths and, and, uh, and vines like a victor for a race would wear. And I want you to notice here at the end, they're going to throw those down. All their trophies and crowns they're throwing down, and we all will. And so... Uh, the four living creatures, who are they? Remember I told you four represents the earth. Represents the earth. I mean, the, earth talk, uh, the Bible talks about four winds and four corners. I mean, that proves the earth's flat, right? Four corners, four winds. I'm kidding. But four, the four living creatures represents the earth. I mean, what you have here is you have the, the wild animal kingdom represented by the lion some versions say calf or ox. That's the domesticated animal kingdom. Then you have humanity. And then you have the, the birds represented with the eagles. Don't ask me about the fish. I don't know. Uh, but th this is the earth. This is, so what you have here is you have God the Father on the throne, and you have uh, all the redeemed church around him, and then around that you have all of earth, everybody is, uh, is, is present here at this time. And what are they all doing? Biblical worship. Now, let me back up. I didn't say unbelievers are present there, but represented from all the earth, the redeemed church is there. Psalm 66, 4 says, all the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. That's what they're doing. They're worshiping God the Father. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Now this is an incredible passage, an incredible chapter, but it's a setup. It's a setup for what's coming in the next chapter. The setup is for one person, the main character of the whole book. And when I say whole book, I'm referring to Revelation, but I'm also referring to the whole Bible. And who's the main character of the Bible? Jesus, the Lamb, the Lamb. It's a setup for the Lamb. When I say setup, I mean it's like preparing the way for what's happening next. Then I saw Chapter 5, in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. You see, so John sees... The one on the throne, God the Father, holding a scroll and an angel asking who's worthy to open it and nobody, nobody was worthy. And so he begins to cry. I believe his weeping symbolizes a world without hope, a world without a savior. And so he's weeping. John is weeping because this, this book, whatever this is, maybe it's the Bible, maybe it's the prophecy of what's about to happen in chapters 6 through 18, whatever it is, it, it, Nobody can open it, and John knows we need it. And one of the elders said to me in verse 5, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And we're going to talk about these seven seals next week. So the elder tells John, says, Don't worry, don't cry. There is one who can open this. There's one who's worthy. It's the lion of Judah. And I saw between the throne with the, four, uh, throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So John hears from the elder, hey, there is one worthy, he's the lion, and he turns to look at this, this lion, the king of the jungle, the, the mightiest of all beasts, but instead of seeing a lion, he sees a 
a lamb, the most vulnerable of animals. And not only is it a, a lamb, but it's got blood uh, stains on him. He, he's somehow looking wounded. By the way, I think this is evidence that when you see Jesus in heaven, he will still bear the marks of the cross. I believe, according to this, when we see Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, he will still bear the marks of Calvary. And I think on purpose, so that you and I will never, ever forget the price he paid for us. And so here he sees this lion who's a lamb, the lion and the lamb. When John the baptizer saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This title for Jesus, Lamb, is the most popular title for Jesus throughout the rest of this book. It's used 31 times. He's the Lamb. That's the way he's referred to. And verse 7 says, He came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. I think when this happened, this is like a scene, I don't know, maybe, maybe you've seen some shows where the climax is building and no one is able and yet at the very end, at the very last moment, uh, the hero walks in and saves the day. And what happened after Jesus did this was that worship erupted. The place erupted. It was like incredible. The scene in heaven, because Jesus confidently, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, walks up and takes the scroll with confidence, saying, I'll open it. Because I've been given all dominion, all power, and authority by the one who's handing me the scroll. So now I want to end this service in this way. I want us to finish out this chapter as kind of a responsive reading. All right? Would you stand with me? And uh, I want you to read where it says church. I'll read that with you. And I'm going to read where it says leader. And we'll, we'll kind of recreate the scene all right, the scene of, of worship to the Lamb. And so, here we go. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying... All right, what happened to her? Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom, priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You all don't seem very excited. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped and all God's people said amen I don't know what kind of personality you have not all of you or what your background has been or I don't watch you even here or anywhere but let me tell you something about when you get to heaven you will be undone you will be undone you will be thrown down and it's nobody's going to throw you down but, but yourself standing in the awesome presence of God. I don't know if you've been flirting with the culture, compromising in your faith, walking around with a lukewarm faith, if you've 
been taking your faith seriously, but if you haven't, you better start. Whether you're premillennial, amillennial, or panmillennial, it'll all pan out in the end. And you can be any of those. It doesn't matter. The next thing to happen is the rapture of God's people. And you need to be ready. And it might happen today, it might happen tomorrow, it might not happen in our lifetime, but it could happen today. Let's be ready. Let's get ready for him. Lord God, thank you for this word. And though we might not all agree on the specifics and the details of how it's going to end up, God, we know you're in charge of it. You're in control. You are worthy. You're holy. And you've got us in the palm of your hand. But Lord, we know we, we will make you vomit we will make you sick if we try to walk around with lukewarm faith if we walk around with secret sins and things going on in our life that we haven't confessed before you I pray for the church God I pray for this church I pray for every lower C church and the capital C church all over the world that we might become serious about who you are and what's about to happen in our world that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be standing over here to your left worshiping. If you have a question about your next steps, just come tap me on the shoulder and we'll, we'll talk about it.